seven o'clock, I'm gonna call the meeting of the Board of Selectmen to order. Um, our first item of business is Pledge of Allegiance, and I would recognize the Deputy First Select Woman to lead us in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All members of the Board of Selectmen are present. Uh, our first item of business is approval of our regular meeting minutes from January 21st. <clears throat> is there a motion? Well, Rita Susan, I'll make a motion to accept the January 21st, 2021 regular meeting minutes as presented. Is there a second? Sarah Muska, Selectman, I'll second. Any discussion or corrections? Seeing none, Selectman Baker. Selectman D'Souza. Aye. Selectman Muska. Aye. And Selectman Nordell. Aye. Uh, three minutes from February 2nd, 2021. Is there a motion? Sarah Muska, Selectman, I move to approve the Board of Selectmen public hearing minutes from February 2nd, 2021. Is there a second? I'll read as soon as I'll second those. Motion's been made and seconded. Uh, any discussion or corrections? Seeing none, Selectman Baker? Aye. Selectman D'Souza? Aye. Selectman Muska? Aye. Selectman Nordell? Aye. Minutes are adopted. Um, under communications, um, I did want to just share with you a proclamation that I issued pertaining to Black History Month. Jason? Yes. You skipped over public participation. Sarah, um, is there any public participation tonight? <clears throat> Seeing none, um, I, I will now draw your attention to the proclamation that I issued celebrating or commemorating Black History Month. Um, and also, uh, testimony that I submitted to the Planning and Development Committee in the General Assembly pertaining to some of the issues that were raised with our delegation um, around um, municipal authority for tax abatements. Um, this was, as you'll recall, something that was brought up and discussed when um, all three of our legislators were um, uh, joined us for a selections meeting in the beginning of January. Um, so I wanted to just share those two things with you. We'll move on to any questions or comments. We'll move on to resignations. I'd make a motion to accept with great regret the resignation of Jamie Sidoriak from the Inland Wetlands and Watercourse Agency as an alternate member and also the Conservation Commission as an alternate member. Is there a second? Selectman Nordell will second that. Motion has been made and seconded. Um, I would uh, stress the with regret. Uh, Jamie was a, a strong contributor um, to both of those boards and um, hopefully we will see her again when, um, when she's ready to come back. Other comments? Selectman Baker. Aye. Selectman D'Souza. Aye. Selectman Muska. Aye. Selectman Nordell. Aye. Um, and Mr. Scalzo. Maureen D'Souza, I'll make a motion um, to accept the resignation of Michael Scalzo um, from the economic, I mean, from the F mission as a regular member. Would we wrap? Is there a second? Second. Sarah Muska, select mail second. Oh, sorry, Alan got me. Yeah, um, <laughs> motion made by Marie, seconded by Alan. Um, it, there was a, a core group of people who served on our ethics commission and, and came in at a particularly contentious time. Um, and, I, and Michael was certainly one of those who I thought handled himself uh, uh, quite appropriately um, in that role and under those circumstances. So uh, I agree that it will be with regret that he steps off. Um, any further comments or discussion? Selectman Baker. Aye. Selectman D'Souza. 
Aye. Blackman Muska? Aye. Blackman Nordell? Aye. See, I told you guys this was going to be a quick meeting. We're, we're moving right along. Motion to reappoint Gilbert Hayes. Veterans Commission regular member for a term expiring March 1, 2025. And Marie D'Souza will second that. Alan, did you want to do them both together? We did. That's okay. You did or you did not? I did, but that's okay. We can just continue. Okay. You want to just amend your motion and vote once? Sure. I amend my motion. And I would like to include uh, Bruce Patinas in that motion as a member of the Veterans Commission, regular member for a term expiring March 1, 2025. Marie, do you amend your second? Yes. Any discussion? Selectman Baker? Aye. Selectman D'Souza? Aye. Selectman Muska? Aye. Selectman Nordell? Aye. And new appointments. Sarah Muska Selectman, I'll move to appoint Steve Smith to the Water Pollution Control Authority as a regular member for a term expiring October 1st, 2024. Second. Motion's been made and seconded. Any discussion? Yes. Charlie. Um, I just wish we could get more people on this board that are actually part of their billing. Um, I don't think there's a single member on their board who actually is subject to their bill. And for that reason, I'll be voting no on this. Any other uh, questions or comments? Seeing none, Selectman Baker. Aye. Selectman D'Souza. Aye. Selectman Muska. Aye. Selectman Nordell. No. On a vote of three to one, the appointment is confirmed. Hey, Jason, yes. before, before we go any further, um, we have an added agenda item. Yeah. Got to go under unfinished business or new business? It's under, it should be under new, new business. Um, and I, I emailed you folks earlier tonight um, or yes. this afternoon. There's an agreement between the town and CPACE um, which is the, uh, an extension, what is it? Um, it's an extension of the Green Bank um, for certain collections that are done on their behalf by the tax collector. And for that work, we get a very, very modest, very, very modest, like $500 um, contribution from CPACE. And they have indicated that they are interested in um, uh, reclaiming that responsibility and also eliminating the $500 uh, payment to the town. Um, it's way more work than the five. Well, at any rate, so the CPACE partial release agreement, um, I'd like to add as agenda item 9E after tax refunds. Can I have a motion to do that? Motion. I'm worried as soon as I did do that. Is there a second? Second. Uh, discussion? Selectman Baker. Aye. Selectman D'Souza. Aye. Selectman Muska. Aye. Selectman Wardell. Aye. On the um, South Road ownership update, um, the uh, when the Bond Commission released or, or approved our request to allow us to subdivide that property, um, they, I'm not sure whether it was inadvertently or intentionally, uh, kept the low income restriction in place, um, which will succeed any real estate transfers and, and thereby bind um, the, the property owner or the potential property owners in any successive real estate conveyances. Um, so with the help of Pullman and Comley and the Department of Housing, um, we're, we're working through Senator Anwar's office to try and get a special act adopted um, that would specifically remove that uh, low income pro, uh, requirement on that four acre parcel um, so that we can actually uh, subdivide and convey that property free and clear. Um, absent that special act, 
there is going to continue to be a low income requirement on that property, which will, that's, that's certainly not what the goal is um, or what's in the best interests of the, the uh, potential property owners. So um, we've had a number of conversations with the Department of Housing where that all has come to light uh, and trying to work through that process. Um, so I just wanted to provide you an update on that and, and let you know that that's still in process, but there are still some um, legislative maneuverings that need to happen there. I don't expect that it would be contentious. The Department of Housing has specifically said that they won't, they would not oppose any such special act. Um, as a matter of practice, they don't get involved with special acts. The, the difference between a public act and a special act is a public act has general applicability. Uh, so when a public act is passed, it applies to all circumstances that are governed by that language. With a special act, it's a carve out for a particular circumstance that is not necessarily applicable in other cases. So in this case, what was done is a property description was included and the, the uh, specific language drafted to lift that low income requirement so that that four acre parcel would not be subject to any said low income requirement prospectively. That would allow us to subdivide the property, convey the property to the homeowners and allow them to convey the property to whomever they want at market rate in future transactions. Um, because the Department of Housing isn't opposing it, this is gonna be one of those circumstances where it almost certainly will not have any opposition. It would just be a matter of making sure that it's attached to a bill that's going to pass. Um, so that's where, um, that's where the help from our legislative delegation will be important. Um, so I just, that's the update on that. I just wanted you to know that there was something still happening there um, and that now we're at the, the mercy of the legislature. As the, the famous federal judge once said, no man's life, liberty, or property is safe when the legislature is in session, but here we are. Um, so that's the update on South Road, which brings us now to agenda, unless there are any questions on that, it brings us to agenda item 9A, um, which is our the resumption of our budget workshop. And in sequence, we'll do the police department followed by emergency management, followed by communications and the police commission. Um, so with that, I would turn it over to Chief DeMarco. Good evening, sir. Hello, everybody. I'm sorry to, this will be the portion of the meeting where it's not so quick. <laughs> so if you could just bear with me for a couple of minutes, I have an opening statement. Well, first, thank you for, for being here tonight with us. We're here to present fiscal year 21-22 budget for the police department. Our budget team consists of our chairman, Robert Leach from the police commission, deputy chief Hart, administrative Lieutenant Matt Carl. And of course, uh, Sergeant Derek Lieb is with us tonight. He's our accreditation manager and Bill Freeman, our communications and technology supervisor is here tonight as well. This year, the, um, the Sergeant will be covering our police accountability bill and police accreditation and definitely how it impacts our budget. Deputy Chief Hart is gonna actually cover the budget, the overall numbers and how we make it work every year. Then Lieutenant Carl is gonna get into the main focus of our budget and what exactly this community needs and that our staff members definitely need. And that's a comprehensive mental health team staff from within the police department. If I can bring up my PowerPoint. Can everybody see it? Yeah, it's going a little slowly though. Hopefully it'll catch up to me here. So before we cover the actual accountability bill and police accreditation with Sergeant Lieb, I wanna remind you all of a very important and productive meeting that we had with our police commission. Then we had it with the board of selectmen and the board of finance. If you'll remember late last year, we were asked to speak with these boards about the pending police accountability act, as well as the state of police relations here in our in our state, but more specifically here in our town. We had this meeting last year after some horrific 
uh, police actions and subsequent demonstrations occurred across the country and had brought national attention to policing and ultimately resulted in our accountability act that we have in place today. During that meeting, I hope you all remember, we described and we demonstrated what our police department and our team members were actively doing in the area of fair and impartial policing. And we demonstrated that we are far ahead of the curve compared to a lot of other police departments. You'll also remember that meeting, we talked about our agency focusing on a healthy organizational culture. In other words, a, a police department personality as one of community caretakers and that we had prescribed to the 21st century policing philosophy and the six pillars as early as 2016. We explained they were like building trust and legitimacy, policy and oversight, technology, social media, training, education, officer wellness and safety, things like that. And from listening to those pillars, most of you can see and understand why we do what we do here at the East Windsor Police Department from our training, our crime prevention efforts, our programs and our strong social media outreach, even our hiring uh, communications and technology supervisor. It's in accordance with those six pillars and it's what serves our community best. And since our meeting last year, you should all know that we've completed the intensive work and the lengthy testing process for tier one state accreditation that Derek's gonna talk about. And we're only awaiting our results. We're confident that we are days or weeks away from state accreditation. For those of us or those of you who follow us on social media, you know that we enjoy 17 plus thousand followers on Facebook alone, and we really work hard in community outreach. It's evident with our toy drives, our shop with a cop, community and cops picnics. We took part in live Facebook um, events with PTSD and domestic violence, and really the hard work of our patrol and our school resource officer and our canine officers, we work hard to serve our community. In that discussion last year, we informed you we adopted things like eight can't wait and uh, of, of duty to report and a duty to intervene and that we value life above all else and that we are adopting that into our policies and our guidelines. We talked about our comprehensive hiring, employee retention program, and we told you that we can report that it's working exceptionally well. We also talked about, if you'll remember, department-wide de-escalation training, verbal judo, crisis intervention training, and that is working and paying off. Now I can report to you confidently that we have and continue to enjoy extremely positive relationships with our community. And this comes from our hard work. We're transparent, we're accountable. Uh, we're accountable to our residents and elected officials. We learn from our mistakes. We're honest with our community. If a complaint is made, we listen. And I can guarantee you that an honest, fair, and comprehensive investigation or review is done. I must remind you that during the meeting last year, we also discussed the connection of all of those efforts or mandates that I just talked about affects our operating budget and our public safety plan. We talked about how it impacted and that we would need budget funding for, for those um, types of efforts. When we ask for funding, it's because we need it to meet those mandates and those regulations, which are often unfunded. We need to meet our community demands. That's what we're gonna to cover tonight as well and perform our jobs in an ever-changing society. So we make no mistake, it's your friends, your neighbors, your family members. In other words, your constituents or our community that's telling us how they wanna be policed by how they call us and what they call us for and the services that they request. And this budget directly focuses on meeting those needs and those mandates. So I'm gonna turn it over to the, uh, Sergeant Lieb and he um, is gonna discuss the uh, Accreditation and Police Accountability Act. For those of you, I know a lot of you know him, but for those of you who don't, he's a patrol commander. He's our public information and social media officer. Um, accreditation manager. He's got over 10 years with the agency. He's got a bachelor's degree, a master's degree, an MPA. He's a graduate of the administrative officers course through the uh, Southern Police Institute and Sergeant Lee. Thank you, Chief. Good evening, everyone. I'm just going to take about 10 minutes of your time and go over the Police Accountability Act, what it is and how it impacts our budget and operations moving forward. So, as you can see, the, it was a 71 page uh, document that was passed this past July by the Connecticut legislature, and that was after the George Floyd incident. 
and it includes many unfunded mandates for law enforcement. It also includes many timeframes that we have to comply with these mandates. As you see, we'll go through the presentation. We've been ahead of the curve in meeting many of those mandates ahead of schedule. Uh, if we haven't met them yet, we certainly have a plan to meet them. And we're gonna talk briefly about some of those mandates. The first one we'll talk about is implicit bias training. So prior to this law, all officers already received bias-free training, cultural competency training. Um, and implicit bias training basically means that it's gonna help officers recognize and mitigate unconscious biases we have about certain groups of people and ensure that those unconscious biases don't impact decisions when we investigate an incident or deal with the public. The second mandate was badges and name tags, and that deals with ensuring that officers are readily identifiable to the public. So on the outermost garment of anything they're wearing, they must have a badge, whether it's sewn or a metal uh, badge, and they must have a name tag. So we've changed our policy. Officers are in the process of bringing their equipment down a sentry uniform and getting all their alterations done, and there's a cost to that. But one of the main things, uh, one of the main mandates with this Police Accountability Bill Act is the use of force changes. As you'll remember, uh, George Floyd, uh, part of how he passed was a neck restraint or a chokehold. And this Accountability Act sets a standard for Connecticut law enforcement that says we can only use a chokehold or a neck restraint during a deadly force incident where we think our life is at risk of uh, a death or serious physical injury or that of a third person is at risk of um, death or a, a serious physical injury. So we don't train in, in chokeholds and neck restraints. We don't condone them. We, we focus more on our resources on de-escalation and crisis intervention training. And that's really important to us. Um, so moving forward, the de-escalation is, is everything. Um, we, we were not 100% there yet with every officer being trained in de-escalation de and crisis intervention because it's tough to get that training. Everybody's trying to get that training, all officers across the state. And then COVID happened. So I think we're about halfway through the department with everybody being trained in de-escalation. And it's just super important because as you see on the screen, we're moving to body cameras. So everything is going to be recorded. And, and we need to, to ensure as a department and as a town that we protect our officers and protect the town from liability and ensure that these officers are properly trained in de-escalation procedures. Because part of the bill is they're gonna look at whether the officer's actions increase the risk of deadly force. And that was never a standard before, but now it is. So they're gonna look at whether the officer exhausted his, um, his de-escalation procedures and his crisis intervention procedures. So it's super important to us and we're committed to, to moving forward get everybody trained in that area. So body cameras, this is one of the areas where we're way ahead of the curve. As you can see by July 1, 2022, every officer in the state of Connecticut needs to have a body camera and every patrol ca uh, car needs to have a mounted dash camera. As of January this year, we we're in full compliance of this and we have been creative and a little bit innovative with that as we got a $75,000 donation from a, another department worth of body cameras. Uh, we took about $32,000 out of the asset forfeiture fund to pay for software and licensing and backup cameras because we can't afford an officer to be out on the street if their camera goes down, we need to have a backup camera to, to, to um, fit them with. And this is really, we have all this equipment now and this is where our information technology supervisor, Bill Freeman comes in because we need somebody to maintain and manage this equipment. And he is really indispensable to what we do. So again, the body cameras, we're in full compliance with that. And, and they're also a, a de-escalation tool in of itself, because when we get to a scene and everybody knows a camera's rolling, it affects the way people behave. Even officers, the public, it, it kind of calms things down. Not all the time, but most of the time. And it's, and it's a great way to, for officers to protect themselves from false complaints of how, how, how they allegedly treated a, a citizen. Um, it's a great training tool. I review every incident that is captured on my shift. And sometimes I see that things could have went better. And we'll put that on the projection screen and go over it during roll call. And it's not a micromanagement tool. It's, it's to get better. We, this is our career. We want to serve East Windsor as best as we can. And that's what it's about. It's about getting better. So it's, it's important to, um, make sure the officers know when they do a good job as well, that, 
you know, to show the other officers that this is the way we do things. And, you know, I kind of get um, fired up about it a little bit because, we, you know, our profession has taken a beat in, in the, the meeting uh, media over the last couple of years. But, you know, we've, we've always done things right in East Windsor and uh, we'll continue to do that. And I, I hope that the, the addition of the body cameras, we can start releasing some of the, the footage to the public and, and so they can see how effective we are when we go to these charged up incidents. And, and uh, I'm extremely proud of the officers we have and I, and I hope the, the public can start to see that as well. Um, another piece about this, Lieutenant Carl is going to go more in depth about the mental health aspect of it, but the mandate here with mental health is that each agency must evaluate the feasibility of having um, a social worker respond with officers to certain calls for service. So that's calls um, of, of mental health, uh, people who are dealing with mental health issues or going through a crisis. We need to come up with a plan and we have. And we've already sent our plan to the Police Officer Standards and Training Council, but it revolves around Officer Tamar Stepien, who, who is a, um, she has a master's degree in social work. She has practical experience. She has advanced training in crisis intervention. And she would work with two part-time social workers and kind of take care, be the caretakers of our, our mental health issues in, in our community. And Lieutenant Carl will, will go further into that. Um, there's also an officer wellness piece to this. Now officers must have a, a, a drug testing every three years, and they must have a behavioral health assessment every five years. So again, there's cost to those, those exams as well. And we're, we're developing a plan where um, maybe we do 20% of officers each year and spread that cost across different budget years. So moving on, we're going to talk about accreditation briefly before I give it over to Lieutenant Carl or the next piece of the um, presentation. So there's the final mandate is the police accreditation. So the mandate is that every agency must be accredited by 2025. And what accreditation is, just to remind you, it's a program for departments to reduce liability, increase professionalism by meeting standards of best practices in law enforcement. And we do that through policy formation. And then we have to go through the process of proving that we actually abide by our policies and we do that through documentation, pictures, uh, police reports and things of that nature. And it's, it's something that's very important to us. We started the process in January 2019, well ahead of, ahead of the legislature requiring us to do so with the Police Accountability Act. Uh, as the chief mentioned, we're about to be tier one accredited and that leaves two more tiers left to get done and we think we can get that done by 20 and 2022 so that's going to be two years ahead of this mandate that will be uh, fully accredited the only snafu with this is currently the police accountability act requires um, agencies to be nationally accredited and the difference between national and state is uh, up the price tag to be nationally accredited it's a about a $13,000 startup fee, and then a $4,000 fee annually, where, where the state process is free. It's more applicable to state laws and best practices. With that being said, there's been a lot of pushback on this national process because smaller agencies can't foot that bill. And Senator Anwar has uh, put forth a bill to put back in the state process, the state process that we're currently undergoing. And we think that's going to get it done. Um, there hasn't been a lot of opposition to Senator Anwar's bill. Um, so we're going to continue on the course we're, we're at. We're going to continue on tier two and then move on to tier three. And again, um, we hope to get that done by the end of 2022, which is going to be three years in advance of the deadline. So that's all I got. Moving on to the next aspect of the presentation. Thank you much, uh, very much, Sergeant. Uh, we're going to move on to the budget proposal, the actual numbers. Uh, Deputy Chief uh, Hart is going to step in and take us through some of the numbers. Um, you'll see that this is from your budget commentaries. They've all been um, given to you in your packets. Uh, Deputy Chief Hart. Good evening, everyone. Uh, good to see you all. I'm. Uh, not going to go too crazy on these because I look looking at the folks I've presented this budget to you many times over um, many years. So uh, we'll go through it pretty quickly. 
And then if you have any questions at the end, I'll be happy to answer them. Uh, the first line uh, that we're showing here in the budget has, does show a $76,549 increase. That is an increase to that particular line, but it's not necessarily an increase to the budget because that $76,549 was previously in the officer salary line, and that was for Mr. Freeman's salary. We hired Mr. Freeman this year, and uh, that adopted budget of um, in the proposed change is just showing that reflective change in this year's or next year's budget. The next um, line is the officer salary line. Uh, it should, as you, as I just mentioned, should show a seventy-six thousand dollar decrease. Um, it does show a nominal decrease. Uh, and I'll explain that because this also includes uh, the new officer position that we'll talk about a little bit further in depth into this presentation. But there is a nominal uh, decrease in this line uh, with, because of uh, senior officers retirement and replacement with, with uh, a junior officer. The next line is a dispatcher salary line. This particular line may be different from the commentary and the budget that we gave you because it was originally showed to be a $1,030 decrease in that line. But between the presentation, us getting the budget to you folks and uh, this date, the uh, dispatcher's contract was settled. And this uh, number right there at 19,115 is the increase of those contractual uh, wages that were negotiated and settled upon. Uh, the next line is the administrative salary line. That is the chief and my salary line and that uh, increase is our contract contractual uh, raises. PD overtime uh, in an effort to try to keep this as flat as possible. Uh, we did not sh show any increase in that line this year. And in the salary line, in, a, in just an attempt to, to uh, try to keep the budget as, as low as we possibly could, we did reduce that training salary line a little bit. Longevity has a decrease. That's mainly because of, uh, as I mentioned before, a senior officer has gone, uh, or had retired. And so that changes the rate of just a slight bit. So that pretty much wraps up uh, the department salary side of the, the budget. This is the operational side of the budget, which is a very small portion of our budget. It's less than 5% of our bu actual budget. Um, we did show an increase in the professional services line because mainly uh, there's a couple need for a couple more additional professional services. One being uh, some of our radar units needs to have some professional work and uh, parts replaced on them. The next line is our vehicle maintenance line. Uh, we maintain our vehicles out of this line. I, I found over the past two years, uh, I did a bit of an analysis and found that we were spending a lot more money on tires. Uh, they're, they're creeping up in price. Um, so we uh, requested an extra $2,000 in that line, mainly for tires. Um, historically, this is a travel line. We increased it a couple of years ago from 500 to 1,000 because of the tolls. It seems to be uh, working for us fine, so we kept it flat at, at 1,000. Supplies and equipment. Uh, this is a line that basically um, takes care of uh, most of the uh, office equipment that we have or need at the police department. And again, we sh uh, we're getting by just fine with that number. So we're gonna keep it flat. This uh, line is the equipment line. It's also uh, basically, it's a line that was put into the budget uh, several years ago uh, to if there was something that the agency needed or the department needed, we would ask for a specific piece of equipment that uh, 4,835 was for a speed sign. Uh, we are not asking for any equipment this year in an attempt to keep the budget as low as possible. And the uniforms, uh, we're showing zero increase. 
Uh, that number has worked for us and, and continues to, so we'll keep it at that point. This line here, uh, we asked for uh, an additional amount of money uh, in our original request, but we were told uh, by the first selectman that he reduced it by 6,000, so we knew that. So to be uh, transparent in our presentation, we uh, have a nominal increase of 500 in that line. So on the entire operational side, we're uh, looking for that, that small increase of $665. So at this point, this is our uh, budget that we're presenting this year. If you have any questions uh, budget related, I would be happy to answer them at this point and, and, uh, and or later in the presentation if you like. Deputy, let, let's just move along with the presentation and take questions at the end. Very well. So at this time, before we turn it over to Lieutenant Carl, who is really going to spell out the focus of our budget. At this time, I just, I really think I need to take a moment to acknowledge out loud what we have here in East Windsor. As a group, this police administration is professional, but we're also humble and it's really hard sometimes for us to brag about ourselves, but I think it's important enough that we need to at least describe our management team and some of our efforts. It's, it's truly an effective, creative, transparent, and innovative team. Um, it is a team that works for the overall good of the community. Um, myself and Deputy Chief Hart now have been a management team since early 2007. Um, it, we've been a team that's been focused on committed financial stewardship, succession planning for the future of our agency and the town serving this community and, and working for an interested and active police commission. On a personal note, um, I can say to you that I surround myself with, with smart people, not yes people, but rather with strong, independent, free-thinking leaders who are well-educated, well-trained, and they're experienced leaders who have the courage to stand up and say and then do what is right for this community or what they feel is right, even in the face of resistance or adversity. Presently, it's a management team that includes in Lieutenant Matt Carl now, Sergeant Derek Lieb, who's with us tonight, who are both actively uh, becoming involved with the daily supervision and management of our police department that's evolving every day. We work tirelessly to be professional, ahead of the curve. I think we've demonstrated a lot of our initiatives that are ahead of the curve, and we're fully committed. We have told you, and then we've shown you that we are cost effective, we're transparent, we're trustworthy. This is our way, our reputation that we've shown. Roger mentioned early that he's presented this budget for years. And that's our reputation that we're cost effective and transparent. And that, that is very valuable to us. The main focus of our philosophy has been that if um, we do not use budget funds or we find a cheaper or cost effective way to do something or accomplish a task, we don't just foolishly spend the money if we don't use it. Rather, we return the funds to the town at the end of the fiscal year. As a team, we're serious about this commitment. In fact, we're now teaching it, training it, and mentoring it, this philosophy through our succession planning. It's most evident because you can see Lieutenant Carl and, and Sergeant Lee here now for a second year, developing and learning and presenting our operational budget. Uh, they're taking greater roles in fiscal management and oversight of the, the police department, as well as budgeting. You will undoubtedly see them next year in a, in a more prominent and stronger role as well. We're a team that brings a vast amount of high level training and professional development, formal education and practical law enforcement and leadership experience. In closing real quick, I wanna say collectively of the four of us or to four of us together, we have almost 100 years of police and leadership experience. Combined, the four of us have 10 earned college or university degrees, many with honors. That includes three MPAs, almost four now that Lieutenant Carl is rapidly approaching the completion of his. We have three graduates of the FBI National Academy among us and two graduates of the uh, leading uh, training at Southern Police Institute 
and two graduates from the Perf Senior Management Institute. So for the foreseeable future, we think we've set the town up very nicely. Anything you want to add, Deb? No, I think you covered it very well, Chief. Uh, I, I think uh, this next couple slides that we're going to show here are going to show just how well we're doing as far as managing your money. So unexpended budget funds, let's take a look at the, the last six years. Go ahead, Deb. Um, yeah, this slide kind of speaks for itself as you can kind of move through it. Uh, 14, 15, 68,000, 69,000, 67,000, 136,000, almost 37,000, and 32,000. Now, some people may see these numbers and say, well, it sounds like you're asking for too much money. Well, a budget is an estimate of what we're going to spend. In those years when the number was higher, is we had unexpected uh, retirements and it was salary. That was uh, basically most of those numbers were salary. And it ranged between 0.8% of that respective year's budget to as high as 4.1% of that budget. So it, as far as an estimate of the cost with uh, a lot of moving parts, I think we're doing uh, a pretty good job in this. As the chief mentions, it's, it's kind of hard to pat ourselves on the back, but that's kind of what we're doing here. But uh, it's through hard work of, uh, of all the people that are, are here, including the police commission. So next I wanna turn it over to Lieutenant Matt Carl and he's going to discuss our proposal and our innovative mental health team. And it really is the main focus of our budget presentation this year. It meets state mandates under the Accountability Act and it meets the demands of this community. As you know, Matt is our new administrative Lieutenant. He was the detective division supervisor and currently oversees that as well as training and evidence. And he has nearly 25 years experience with the East Windsor Police Department. Um, Matt does have a bachelor's degree from Central Connecticut State University and he's completing his master's degree. He is a graduate of the FBI Academy as well as the um, SPI uh, school. Um, and I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Lieutenant Carl. Thanks, Chief. Um, just to get started here, I'm going to take you through just some housekeeping. I'm going to take you through the next few slides um, and try to explain what we're going to put lay out forward with our mental health team and the solution to what Sergeant Lee talked about for um, our uh, accountability act and how we're going to handle the, the calls that we're getting for service. But while I go through the next couple of slides, if you do have a, a question, there's a, there's a section in the end to, uh, to ask a question, but you'd be doing me a favor if you think about it right away, go ahead and interrupt. I have no problem with that. Um, <clears throat> so to get started here, you know, I could go into hours of conversation about why we got to where we are in society and, and the police uh, and why we're sort of ill-equipped to handle the mental health, but we don't have the time for that. But I do want to highlight a couple of, of areas where obviously COVID, everybody's hearing about COVID, and that was a stress on society. Prior to that, there was an explosion of the uh, opioids, uh, the addiction that we're dealing with in town and all over the, the region and the country. And then there's just the lack of funding that we have for mental health. So um, I believe with all of that, the police have been unjustifiably tasked with solving the problems in the community when it comes to mental health because the attitude has always been just call the police, you know, they'll come, they'll take care of it. And that this is sort of a little unrealistic with, with what we were trained with doing. So with the events of the nation, we started to move forward with uh, thinking about how we could do this. But prior to that, we had the solution of what we're going to lay out today, which is our, our officer, um, Tamara Stepien. So um, that being said, sometimes I'll be reading through the slide and sometimes I'll just, uh, I'll just uh, add a couple of things to that. So Chief, if you can uh, go to the next slide there. Um, in, in today's society, we must recognize the demand for police reform and re-imaging of the police departments. Uh, we must have a better comprehensive uh, service for the types of calls that the police are, are experiencing. And I have a slide after this that's gonna tell you, take you through that. But I want you to focus in on a reoccurring non-criminal calls for service. These are the calls that we're going to that don't have an element of crime, but they're always happening over and over and over again. 
and we're showing up and we're really not um, offering uh, the best services that we could do. So chief, if you go to the next slide, I'll set you guys up with uh, the primary, the primary task for police social work is to provide services for community residents, such as crisis intervention, uh, mediation and referrals. The types of uh, social problems that police are involved with social workers may vary from police department, but typically they include mental health, domestic violence, and juvenile delinquency and addiction. Uh, the calls for service that we're going to, we're showing up and we're rarely offering a long-term solution. Uh, it's often inevitable that we'll be back to the same address, the same problems over and over and over again. So Chief, if you uh, go to the next slide, that'll show what we've laid out here. Give me a second, Matt, it takes a second to boot. We're gonna to get to see some of the work product that our communications <clears throat> technology supervisor has been providing to us, which is a, a realistic look now at data that's actually occurring in East Windsor. So like to see, see I do. So if everybody can see this, I'm gonna eventually take you all the way around the board, starting in the top left, go to the top right, bottom uh, right and then the bottom left. But so you can see this number of 141. So this is historical data that Bill Freeman has grabbed from our CFS, our calls for services from last year, 2020. Um, we are hyper focused in on uh, accurately grabbing this data. So going forward, now that we've made a few changes and what we're doing for our, our, our collection of data, this accurate will be, this information will be accurate and, and, and much more um, focused on areas that we need to do going forward. But if you see this chart right here, you can see that you have, um, you know, domestic violences. Last year we had 69 stolen motor vehicles, um, 36 in the bottom left corner. You can see that DWIs 30, missing persons 10, robberies six. Uh, breach of peace, 171, larcenies, 169. But I want to stop and focus in on this mental health, 141. So we looked at our historical data and came up with what we believe is 141 cases where we know that we had an element of mental health when we were going to that call. And those were either reoccurring uh, individuals that we dealt with before or that we had to use our um, mental health skills to, to sort of address that 141 is a, is a big number. So if you think about the calls that we're going through, um, you know, if, if, if we had a mental health team and, and that mental health team was handling 141 calls per service a year, I can tell you that's more than the detective division does. And the detective division is bigger than one person. Um, it, it's a lot to do. That's, you know, quite a bit of calls because these aren't simple calls show up. These are follow-ups. These are getting involved in people's lives and, and finding a comprehensive solution to handling their, their issues. So they're, they're in-depth and they're complex. So that just sort of addresses that 141. You go over to the top right, you'll see the mental health calls by day of the week. We were able to break down that chart by day of the week to, to show where we're the busiest. So if we put, this, get, put together this mental health team, we can focus on the areas and show that, you know, although we have mental health calls all day long, every day, we have clusters and where those clusters come in. So we can focus the best, um, the best of our abilities on those times and, and uh, really address those issues. So if chief, if you go back to, if you, if you look in the bottom left, everybody can see that those are the hours of the day starting at midnight all the way through. Oh, the, uh, I'm sorry, bottom right. I'll figure out my rights and left when I get a little older, but the bottom I right. So anyways, <clears throat> these are the hours of the day. You can see the calls for service out of those 141 were broken down. Midnight, one in the morning, two, three, four, five. So these are the ones that we're seeing all day long. You can say they, they stay pretty consistent. The lowest, I think, is five in the morning. But if you go back to the main chart, Chief, and you click on any of the data week, so click on, say, Saturday or Sunday or Tuesday. If you click on that pie chart, we further can drive it down to the day of the week. So if this is a Tuesday, you can see that we know that we have calls for service uh, on Tuesday when this clusters are. So we can focus that team in this area at those times to really, really provide the maximum amount of service. The intended, con the, the intended effect of this is that the other officers that are going there now, they'll get, they're freed up and that's what we wanna do. We wanna free up our other officers to do work in the areas 
that are a focus of what policing is. And that's the high crime areas, traffic accidents, motor vehicle, stuff like that. So the bottom left, the last area, and I know that I'm moving through very quickly and we can explain this uh, when you ask, if you ask questions later, um, but in just the time, I'm trying to move it along. You can see that the first, the highest call that we have that re results in mental health is the medical aid. Uh, then we go to aided person, we go to a welfare check. You have to get to the fourth reason for the call that we are going on before you get the first example where the initial call has an element of a crime. So that's where we get these reoccurring non-criminal complaints that are resulting in the bulk of that 33, 28, and 27. That's the pretty decent amount of those 141 before we're, before we're getting where the police are actually showing up. So you see here, this is the mental health uh, screen it's the clusters we can break down. It's a heat signature. I believe, no, this is the, uh, this is the clusters. I, I apologize. This is the clusters for where the mental health calls are, are coming in. You can see it's the, it's the basic center of Broadbrook and basic center of Warehouse Point. We could further break those down to the heat. We have a heat signature part where, the, where they are and we can give the mental health calls um, by CFS, Chief, if you hit that one, right? there those are the calls in town so I, the reason we put this up is you can tell they're, they're town wide all these calls are coming in town wide so um back to home and uh moving on to the to the next slide if you could <clears throat> this takes a minute for this to load apologize So um, you can see there's a strong need for a more permanent solution for the, for the uh, reoccurring calls. What we're really looking to do is, I talked about the comprehensive solution, but we're trying to prevent crime and we're trying to offer, offer uh, safety and stability to the conditions that, we're, that you're seeing us um, have to go through and answer. You see the innovation solutions. We're trying to meet the needs of what the society is bringing to us. So the next slide uh, you'll see on here, you know, the East Windsor Police Department, um, you know, the, we have a, the, the additional functions that we have in police as social workers include training the police officers in stress management, mental illness, substance abuse, domestic violence, child abuse, and they, they provide our team will provide consultation to the police officers and, 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 the, and the families alike. Um, we currently uh, staff a full-time police officer and Tamara Stepien. She's been with the agency for about 10 years. Um, a little bit on her background, Sergeant Lee went into it, but I can add a little bit more. Um, she has a master's in social work. Uh, which she's obtained over the last four or five years. She has over 900 hours of volunteer service uh, as a clinician, and she's got clinical experience. And this last November, November of 2020, she became uh, licensed in the state of Connecticut as a, as a social worker and a clinician. Um, the reason why I want to highlight that as a, uh, as a solution is that most of the, the PDs in, the, in our state and around the country are trying to address the issues that are, that are being put upon them by integrating social workers into police work. We, our solution is, is better because we have police officer who became a, a social worker. Nobody else has that solution. If you tried to get that solution, it would, it, would, it would take you four years because like I said, we've got tens of thousands of dollars invested in Tamara Stepien in her education um, for that. And the benefit is that a police officer knows the officers, they know the community, they know how we react uh, to situations, they know how to train us better to handle situations, they know our lingo and they know our experiences. Social workers have a value in other police departments, but there are, there are struggles to integrate them into police work and police society. So um, <clears throat> that being said, we, uh, you can go to the next, next, next screen. I want to talk about what the, what the um, program would look like and then our return on investment. So what the program is going to be is uh, if we get the replacement for Officer Stepien, she would be full-time dedicated officer 
she would work with two part-time social workers that have, uh, are in the process of being hired and, and vetted by the police department that would help her and augment her in, uh, in answering those calls. They would provide peer support for the police department. They would provide training internally in crisis intervention. Uh, Tamara actually instructs part of the crisis in intervention, the ability to work with us for de-escalation techniques. And that starts with, um, the training starts with getting our officers with the uh, idea that right, right from the beginning, our dispatchers are collecting the information on a call. They're gathering information. Our officers are assessing, assessing situation, threat, and risks before they're getting there. <clears throat> they're, they're trained to consider our police powers. Is this an area that we actually have authority over, or do we need to look at our policies and follow our policies? Identify other people that we may need to get to a team, like a crisis team or a 211 uh, sort of situation where we need mental health um, evaluators. And then ultimately act, review, and reassess. And what that means is that we can put a comprehensive team together, uh, a plan, act, and if it works, it works. If it's not, we'll go back to zero and start over again, but we'll have those people in place that, to help us out. And that comes with department-wide training that they would, uh, they would put together. Um, and the mental health team basically would work with our officers for, for, for the peer support and the after action reviews when we have critical incidents and things that uh, really affect society and affect our officers. So the, you'll see where the return on investment is, is the community has already invested tens of thousands of dollars of taxpayer uh, money into, into her training and into our training together. And that return on investment will come back to us where we get internal training, we get peer support, rapid response to these uh, non-reoccurring sort of calls for, uh, for services. We have a more comprehensive long-term plan that we can provide them that frees up the police officers in the districts to go do the investigations of traffic collisions and, and focus in on those areas where there might, there might be more crime or certainly the, the, uh, the appearance of crime and get them back to the police work. So how did we get here? Um, the chief mentioned earlier that the community, we have trust and legitimacy and I think we've worked hard to get that with the community, but ultimately our authority comes from the community and the types of calls that the community wants us to handle and how they want us to police. Some communities want to worry more about blight or loitering or things like that. Our community clearly you can see where they have a need for answering mental health calls for service and addiction. So that we're answering that call with this team and the whole goal is to try to prevent it in the future, take a preventative measure and trying to get into the homes, trying to get into their lives, trying to build these long-term solutions. Uh, that way, educating our, our department along the way for our officers to, to identify these things, we'll have a team to refer these cases back to. And then also um, we have a team that would also help our officers with their mental health issues that, that, that they may come up with along the way of uh, their journey and their career. So if there's any questions um, or if you guys want to chief deputy, you want to add anything to that? Yeah. You want to, you want to say something Dep? As I mentioned earlier, when we were looking at the uh, salary line for the officers, I mentioned that we would be talking about it. This is a new position as, as Lieutenant Carl had said, we're looking to um, hire a new officer. They then take Tamara out of patrol, have her dedicate to this program, a team effort working with two part-time uh, licensed social workers. Um, we're currently uh, working with the town right now uh, through the Youth Service Bureau funding. And they would continue that uh, through here. Our goal is to move forward and deal with these reoccurring mental health calls and try to reduce them over the year. That, that's our goal. We hope to be able to come to you in two or three years and show you a re reduced number, not a 141 number, but something a little more palatable to show that we're getting people help, we're getting people the resources they need. Some of the envisionment of the office space is available right off of our lobby it would provide a level of security and protection because it's right off the lobby, but it provides privacy for people to come for, for services and resources and help. And 
And that should really jump out at you at the bottom of that screen that it is a preventative and proactive measure to address what your friends, neighbors, community members are asking for by way of what we just showed you through our calls for service. And, and we're still convinced that that's scratching the surface. When you saw like medical aids and things of that nature, sometimes that coding doesn't capture mental health, but it happens to be a mental health capacity to it. I can tell you um, to close out, we've had a, an incredible past week and a half here with mental health calls. Lieutenant, if you got two seconds just to cover just the, the last 10 days. Sure. So we had four significant calls in the last several weeks. Uh, we had a, a resident that tried to take their life. And, and un unfortunately for us, uh, they were using a shotgun. The neighbor was able to wrestle the shotgun away, but it did go off and fire into the ceiling. Uh, that's got a positive outcome. We had another officer show up to a call where um, another one of our other residents was trying to take uh, her life. Uh, our entire shift uh, spent uh, quite a bit there at the call to, to again come with a, the, the outcome was fantastic because she was able to, we were able to disarm her and get her into an ambulance and, and get her services. That is a, that was a reoccurring call because we were there several years ago um, with different officers doing the same thing. So that's one of the ones that, that was, was reoccurring. We also had an a 11 year old juvenile that, that wanted to um, harm uh, a, a parent with a knife we were able to come to a positive solution and conclusion with that. And uh, lastly, most recently, we had a resident in town that wanted to take their own life. Our officers were able to get to the scene, disarm them of several knives and, and get them some help. Uh, all this comes uh, with what we're able to do with the limited training we have already with, with our officers being trained in, in, in the critical incident and, um, and the response and those things I talked about formulating a plan right from the beginning. So if we can, if we can handle these calls, the issue is, is there's not, not gonna be a lot of follow-up because we don't have a mental health team that would follow up with these, with these folks. But if we can get that team in place, these are the types of things that every single one of those incidents has a potential, a high potential actually uh, for use of force and sometimes deadly force. We've been able to avoid that, thank God. And hopefully that, that continues in the future and we keep our use of force low. But this, I think this, this program is invaluable to, to offering that solution uh, for that. And that's just, that's just in the last couple of weeks. <laughs> I guess before we get to questions, we'll follow the first selectman's instructions. We'll come up to the, the ending of it real quick. And, and this is our proposed police department budget or our financial plan and public safety plan for crime prevention and reduction and to provide services to, to people who really need it. And, and we believe that the demand's overwhelming that, that this mental health team will be a true community asset. Um, if uh, you have any questions of us, we'll turn it over to you now. And we hope you support us and, and support our budget in serving this community. I'd, I'd start off, um, I do have a couple of questions um, and Chief, I'll direct this to you, but if you want to um, task somebody else on the call, that's, uh, that's fine too. Could you talk a little bit more about the critical incident training? Yeah, I'll probably turn it over to one of the other guys for that. It, it, it's, um, it's, it's a very good training. It's difficult to get, it's lengthy and with COVID and, and everything. Um, Lieutenant or Derek, which one's better for you? Think Matt, you? I could do that. I, I supervise a training division. So Tamara in, in her travels actually became an instructor in a critical incident um, training. And it's a week long course. It's five days and it's open to dispatchers and, and um, our, our, tra our civilian team and mostly our officers. In the five day course, they learn the escalation coping skills how to handle situations of critical incidents and in and, and different types of um, things that, that may or may not be uh, presented to us. We were marching along with getting our police department, um, you know, largely, if not try to get everybody um, in that training, obviously, and it's the same sheet of music you hear all the time. COVID brought that to a stop to a, to a halt about a year ago. The training um, is not really 
good under Zoom conditions. It's really more of an in-person sort of training. So we got, we've got um, a percentage of our police department and a percentage of our dispatchers trained. We obviously strive for a higher percentage, but what we do have, um, like I said, it's so important for our dispatchers to start identifying those calls right from the beginning and start gathering that information and getting it out to the officers, even if it's just about past history, any weapons, anything involved, because we can start formulating, like I said, those five core principles that we look to do before we get anywhere and before we take action. You know, anytime you, you try to close time and distance in any situation you have in life, and certainly police departments find this all the time, you close time and distance, you start limiting your options and you make uh, bad decisions. Bad things happen when, you, when, when those things happen. So if we can create time, distance and, and, and information and, uh, and sort of de-escalate those situations while we get the people in place, uh, that's always a positive outcome. But it, it leads to a better positive outcome. And critical incident training gives the officers the tools to do that. Um, we are in the process of moving forward when we can open up our budgets and we can actually open up the training to, uh, to the officers, but Tamara coming off of patrol and dedicated to 40 hours will definitely assist that. Does that answer your question, uh, Yeah, it, it does. I just, um, in a uh, private conversation, you know, I, I just um, wanted to, to make clear an assumption that I had incorrectly had, which was that uh, CIT is something that could be done during a roll call. And I just wanted, after your explanation privately, Lieutenant, I just wanted to make sure that it was understood by all that um, that's, in, that's an in-depth training. And to have a high percentage of, uh, of sworn officers and dispatchers with that training is both an accomplishment and a goal that we should continue to, to work to advance. And, and so my mis I didn't want my mis initial misunderstanding to be shared by others. Um, one of the things that, that I learned in school was that public policy and public administration really should be predicated on evidence-based decision-making. And I think that um, you guys have done an excellent job of showing the data analytics for the, the police response calls that the department is asked to respond to um, on, a, on an annual basis. I'm guessing, uh, and this might be somewhat of a, a question for Bill, but I'm guessing that um, 12 month aggregated data is a, is a rolling 12 months and not an annual 12 months. Is that correct? You want to hit that one, Bill? Sorry, I'd unmute myself. Um, we can make it either or, depending on what you want to see. Well, and that's that actually is kind of the answer that I was hoping for. Um, because as powerful and as compelling as the data that you provided is, it really is only worth anything if we do something with it. Um, and that's why I'll, I'm comfortable sharing that um, there, uh, there was mention of this in the Journal Inquirer, this, this um, uh, police officer becoming a, a sworn social worker you know, in this mental health team arrangement. I'm getting calls from other municipal leaders saying, hey, we wanna talk to you about this. Um, this, is, this is something that I think is absolutely progressive policing. It's, it's a, a cutting edge, you know, inverted way of, of addressing a problem different from what has conventionally been done. And it's already getting really positive feedback from neighboring towns that are saying, you know, can we buy a cup of coffee and, and have a conversation about what the thought process is here? Now, I'm not the person to, to share that information. That's something that um, Chief DeMarco and his team deserve all the credit for. But I think the presentation that they've laid out makes it clear why this is, this is the number one priority that I'm laying out in the budget this year. I think if we do anything new, this is the most important thing that we could do. And, and um, they've not just put a compelling narrative together, but they have demonstrated with facts that this is something that can be beneficial to the community as a whole. So Chief, you and your whole team deserve a lot of uh, accolades for um, the creativity and the hard work that's gone into this presentation. I, I appreciate that. I cannot um, acknowledge enough how how incredible they've all been. Um, I, I got to remind you, Bill's only been here for a few months, and and you're right. It's what you do with the data, and um, we're doing this on the crime and disorder end of things too, so that we can 
hot spot and place our police officers in districts and places at times um, when things are happening. Lieutenant Carl went over that with mental health and days and times. We're, we're just scratching the surface of what we're capable of doing. Um, we are evolving as a police agency and, and in a good way. And it, we're working together as a team and I cannot um, acknowledge how well they've all done. It's been incredible. And I agree with you, this thing is, is really preventative. It's progressive, I, I guarantee you. We're not only gonna get area police departments in towns and cities calling us, there's gonna be a lot more. We're in a, a partnership now and through a grant with a private company to try to embed a social worker and we've had some difficulty with it. Deputy Chief Hart can talk at length at some of the difficulties that we've had with it. We are looking at it the opposite way as Lieutenant Carl described. We think that this program will have a town-wide impact already with youth engagement and social services. And I think it'll be a town-wide resource that we will all be proud of. Well, and that's the other piece of this that I find particularly compelling is that this is, this is a interdepartmental partnership that's that's already stepping up. I, I mean, just the the notion of this as a possibility is already stepped up. Um, the the recruitment work we've been trying to do around the Youth Service Bureau support staff. Um, that's been a need that the community has, and and we need to do something different in that space. And this is a natural partnership. Um, so, you know, I I again, this is I think a very th this is a cornerstone piece of this budget. Um, so I, I can't see with the chief, with your still sharing the screen, I can't see any of, uh, of the other participants, but if there are any members of the board of selectmen or the board of finance that have any questions or comments for, uh, chief DeMarco and his team, oh, there we go. Um, I would, uh, invite those comments. Sarah. Sarah Sarah Muska Selectman. Um, it's not a question, um, just a comment. I want to thank you, as always, for your very thorough and informative presentation. Um, it's much appreciated. And thank you very much for always keeping us ahead of other communities and always looking ahead to do what is needed. Um, and in the area of domestic violence, having done work with the network, um, I feel there really is a need for this in our community to have someone local that victims can turn to um, that has been a topic of discussion. So um, I feel there is a need and, and I definitely will be supporting um, this mental health team. So thanks for your presentation tonight. Other questions or comments? Alan, Marie. Marie first. Late. All right, uh, Marie, then Ellen. Yeah, um, I don't want to uh, add to the, the conversation um, because we can go for hours, but I just want to say everything that's been said today about the um, police department, I agree with. Um, and I've had said over the last five years how impressed I am with the full going thought process um, being handled by the police department um, to better serve our community. So kudos to everyone that's involved and for having the foresight to send somebody to school to um, get that degree um, that will only help with the town. But I have one question because I'm a little confused and I just want for clarification. So we're asking for um, the mental health position for the police department and we're asking for a social worker in the social services department no, or no. Is that augmentation to stand behind this request. Do you want to handle that, uh, sir, or would you like me to start? No, I, I'll I'll start, and then you can correct me where I'm where I have some holes here. But um, their their proposal is to take a sworn officer out of the patrol division and establish their own uh, mental health team, still as a sworn officer within the police department, plain clothes, but it's still having full police authority. Um, that would be supported by two part-time social workers funded through our Youth Service Bureau grant. So it's a collaborative between the Community Services Department and the Police Department. Chief, did I so, cover it? Yeah, and mainly, the and, and let's, we'll put it to budget terms. It's the $56,000 that you see in the officer line that I'm asking for that's going to pay for a patrolman that now allows us to take camera out of that patrol position and be focused wholly on the mental health team 
in a marriage with the two social services people. So they'll be able to work, they'll work under our control, our philosophies, our guidelines, our policies in a complete marriage with social services and Melissa and the whole nine yards okay. doing all that work. Now, are you at any point going to take one of the social services through the Board of Education and intermarriage them into that group too? It's funny that you mentioned that. Um, I believe Lieutenant Carl took a call already. Um, am I speaking out of term, Matt? No, so uh, Marie, that's that's exactly uh, right. I've been in touch with the um, superintendent and the schools and um, also Melissa. The goal, if we can get this in place, and I didn't want to get too far ahead and be presumptuous, but the goal is to get all the partners and, and the players in town together so that we could do wraparound services with the school, with the, the, the Board of Education support, with the Youth Services Bureau, our, our partners with domestic violence. You know, the bigger vision here is that this unit will, will grow and will have other entities. The Board of Education and the school district has excellent resources down there. Um, and, and I think that we could tap into those because a lot of that uh, some of the stresses and the pressures of mental health and the things that we're faced with come out of the school districts. Real, real quick, I want to focus on one thing because it has a lot to do with what uh, Selectman D'Souza said, but also what Selectman Muska just said, and that's in the area of domestic violence is where we're hitting, I think it was 69 or 70. There's a mental health component to domestic violence as well, but also a services component where one party might need help getting housing might need help getting a credit card or a safety phone. That's, it's a mental health team, but that's the services, the wraparound services, youth and engagement in schools. So it's all gonna wrap in. That's the vision of ours. That's where we wanna see it go. Thank you, appreciate it. Well done guys. Thank you. Other questions or comments? Alan. Yeah, so um, I do want to echo, I think it bears repeating uh, what I think uh, Lieutenant Carl said and, and others have said, uh, you guys definitely have earned the trust, both financially and from a peacekeeping standpoint. Uh, and I think we have a lot to be proud of in this town. So I just wanted to say that. Um, Selectman D'Souza's comments uh, or question actually brought out part of what I was going to ask. Uh, so I'd just like to take that a little bit further. And, and, you know, I guess I'm envisioning right now, you, when you have these contacts, these mental health contacts, uh, you know, the officer is there, they kind of diffuse the situation and, and whatever is going to happen with that person is going to happen. But that's the end of your involvement until next time there's a call. Uh, maybe you, and, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but maybe you're saying, you know, I, I suggest you go see somebody or get some help or, or whatever. In this new paradigm, what are you envisioning the handoff being? I'm seeing, or I guess I'm hearing that the that uh, the camera is going to, you know, basically take on some cases, uh, but eventually they're going to have to hand them off and and, and you know um, to other agencies or whatever. How far does how far do you guys envision taking this uh, with with each of these cases? So that, that's a that's a great question, and and I want you to think that we're uncaring, but, you know, we run a district or a, 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 a manpower of two officers and a supervisor. They go to a call, they handle it the best they can, get them whatever services they can, but they have to move on to the next call or do the next thing. They can't always get back and things of that nature. So we're talking about that case follow-up. The, the value of the social worker, and I can tell you now, Matt talked about it briefly, with her 900 hours and volunteer work, she's, she's integrated with a lot of agencies already working with them. It's that what a social worker can bring, the networking, the resources, what they bring forward to help people. It could be from you know signing up for VAMS to get your vaccine all the way to doing your taxes or, or finding a counselor in addiction. That's the type of stuff that she's gonna take over. We're not envisioning where she's gonna be the counselor or the, the person doing the actual treatment. It's that networking and services, although she's pretty talented at that end of it too, but we're talking about bringing that to it. Deputy? Yeah, I'd just like to add, we currently, as Chief mentioned earlier, we're in a partnership with a grant with CHR. So, so Community Health Resources, and we have an embedded 
social worker that comes to the agency once a week. So we already have the system kind of in place, but we're finding that our needs are a little more than once a week. Um, so we know how we have a referral process. So uh, just to give you a quick overview of what we foresee, it would continue the, the same way that we're doing now. The officers would respond if um, Officer Stepping was working and she could respond as well. That would be helpful. If she's not there, we could do referral forms, which we already have in place. The officers are already doing referrals to CHR. We would just point them to Tamara. Tamara would then do follow-ups and try to work with the folks. And one of the problems we're having with CHR right now is it's a civilian social worker and she's not, she tries to get into the homes, but she doesn't have a rapport with the folks. And she's, she's finding out that they're, they don't even wanna answer the door when she does the follow-up follow up because she's unknown to the community. Amber's known to the community and she has a rapport with a lot of people in our community. So we would expect that she would follow up and with the assistance, assistance of the other uh, social workers working part-time, they would be able to work together to form some kind of a plan to get the person help as, as best they could. I don't want to discount the second portion of that. And it was, it was back about 10 slides ago, but it's a dual component. It's not only for the community, but it's for, for the employee as well. We're police officers and we see a lot of repeated compounding stressful situations and, and PTSD and, and stress and depression. Sometimes the town employee is the, the best clients to, to the social worker and we want to provide services and peer support and training and referrals um, that way too. So that, that's, the, um, that's the vision. So I, I think a couple of points I just want to um, lay out there. The town has already paid for uh, Officer Stepien to become a, an MSW. She is, and, and if anybody's ever known a social worker, they're not just a social worker when they're on the clock. They, they are, from the moment they wake up until the moment they go to bed, they are social workers. Um, but that's, that's an important point here is that Officer Stepien is currently on third shift. So one of the things that can be, I would imagine, uh, derived from the, the data analytics that uh, Mr. Freeman is able to pull out um, is you can actually target her shift obligations around when the demand for mental health services are um, using th the data to actually show that there is a need on this particular day during this particular window for that enhanced service for the community. Um, that doesn't necessarily comport with a, a third shift patrolman. Um, so I, that's, this is, I think, a, a more creative way of using the resources that they have available. Other questions or comments? Charlie. Selectman Nordell. Yeah, great job guys. I, I think this is an incredible concept and I can't see anybody not being able to get behind this and support you guys. So good luck and thank you. Thank you. Um, Norian or Tom? Um, my only thought, um, when other communities come to uh, see what we're doing, make sure nobody's poaching any of our officers. I think we wanna keep <laughs> well, them. It's funny that you say that, sir, because I can tell you right now, we have something that's very unique. We have a certified licensed social worker who happens to be a certified licensed police officer. Nobody has that. And it is highly sought after. I can tell you right now, I'm not making threats, but it, if this doesn't happen here, it might happen somewhere. They will poach and they will come. They really just, will. Just be careful. <laughs> we are. Noreen, any, any questions or comments from you? No, I'm all set, thank you. Amy, do you have anything to add on this one? Nope, I'm good. Um, guys, awesome job. And thank you so much for the forethought you put into the proposal. It clearly shows how well thought out the, your, uh, your concept is. We have a couple more budgets to do uh, with you though. Um, and I think the next one, I lost my agenda. Hey, can I just ask one budget question on the police sure. side? Hey Chief, um, the dog pound, 
you got the you got the money in the budget. Uh, there's been some recent um, disagreements between the police commission comment that was made and the response that was made at a meeting um, that hit Facebook. Um, are we good at the dog pound? Yeah, that's been a, a long term issue. Um, do you do you want to go over that deputy or do you want me to? I can, I can uh, feel that uh, chief. Um, well, you Technically, yes, we are good at the dog pound. There, there was a um, capital improvement project that was put forth by facilities uh, that I think this may be the second or possibly the third year that it's been put forth to do some much needed improvement down there. Um, some, of the, some of the things are mandatory and have to be done. Um, the concrete has to be sealed properly. Um, there's a few other uh, minor things that have to be done to bring the pound up to uh, acceptable code. We are grandfathered in for a lot of the, the reasons uh, that are on the, the list. So the, the $60,000 would probably do us very, very well if the town would in fact in, invest that capital improvement at some point. But currently, there's a brand new heater down there. There's a brand new um, oil tank down there. Uh, facilities has been paying a lot of attention to it down there. The thermostat has been moved into the kennel area so the temperature doesn't go below a certain point. The doors had been replaced that lead outside. We got rid of heavy steel doors mm -hmm. that could have injured the animals and replaced them with a polyurethane doors. Um, they do seal better than the um, metal doors sealed, but they are not weatherproofed 100%. But because the, the um, thermostat is in the kennel area, even if it somewhat uh, does reduce the heat with the doors, the heat, the thermostat will kick the heat on and, and it heats it adequately. So I spoke personally with the ACOs and and I think this is part that some folks are missing. When these things hit Facebook and they think that the animals are being mistreated down there, that couldn't be further from the truth. We have two very professional part-time animal control people who love animals. And if there was a problem down there, you better believe that they would be pounding the door down to the chief's office and my office to get it fixed if those animals were in danger in any way, shape, or form. So, you know, above all of this fray, we need to thank our professional part-time ACO people. They do a lot of hard work for us. Thank you, and I agree. And I wanted to put it out there because I want to get rid of that disclaimer that was put out there, misnomer, whatever, that we're good up there. Thank you. Further questions or comments from members of the board? So if we're ready to turn the page on the police department proposal, um, next up is emergency management. Um, and I would call on our emergency management director, Chief DeMarco. To go back to share the screen, I promise you we'll return now to quick meeting. This one will be quick. This is our emergency management proposed budget. We submitted this to you in writing, but we wanted to include it real quick that we have employed the Everbridge suite, our communicate uh, notification system that is in full effect for the town. Uh, we work with and continue to work with statewide emergency management region three to keep uh, the town supplied with PPE and let's talk about the COVID-19 pandemic. I can tell you now, this has been the most challenging year for us. Um, there's, there's just a, an enormous amount of work to do. And through the teamwork that this town brings with public works and elected officials, we've been able to meet the demands and needs of the community. We're still doing our tabletop and group exercises 
meeting with Unified Command. In fact, uh, the first selectman called the meeting a couple days ago to talk about um, vaccination clinics, et cetera. So we're still working very well with everybody. Um, we added a generator, or DPW did, to the town hall annex. Um, so you're going to see an increase to the maintenance line. Um, we brought on Denise Menard as a community liaison during the um, pandemic so that she can work towards meeting any needs. Some of our goals and priorities were still very weak in the area of shelters. Of course, opening a shelter during COVID would, would be very difficult, um, but it continues to be uh, a priority to us to plan for the future. Uh, one of the difficulties is PPE. We do have a good supply now and I'm comfortable with it, but it requires constant maintenance. Um, right now there's an extreme shortage on gloves. Back at the beginning of COVID, there was a, a shortage on every single thing, but we're townwide, we're in pretty good shape. Our operations plan is still uh, something we work on all the time, updating it. Um, We've been doing that as well. Succession planning, we're now in a very good situation where there are four of us, myself, the deputy, um, Lieutenant Carl is now third in command in an operational component, and Judy Tweedley is still doing all of our paperwork and uh, grant work. We're working with the state in North Central on vaccinations. We're very active with that. I'd like to say goodbye to it um, as soon as possible, but unfortunately, we just don't know when we will do that. Um, I think it's gonna be here for a while. And then here is the budget. Deputy. Okay, I'll start at the top with the uh, stipend line. Um, that's showing an increase of our adopted budget, but if you remember during this fiscal year, uh, the select board and the board of finance increased the stipend line for the chief and myself in to include uh, Lieutenant Carl now. So that's just showing that net change uh, over uh, the adopted budget of 2021. Um, so the uh, chief mentioned, okay, the phone line is next. Um, that is showing an increase of uh, 8,565. The reason why we have that increase is in there is that that's the quote yearly cost for the Everbridge suite system, our community notification system. We increased the equipment maintenance line $1,000 because we have now the increase of the town hall generator to maintain as we move forward. And it's roughly cost us $1,000, <clears> excuse me, uh, per generator per year. Um, and that's the, uh, concludes the increase on the op side of 9,565 for a total uh, increase for the uh, 2022 year of $23,355. Any questions uh, for the emergency management team? I just have a comment. We did pay for the Everbridge this year, but we paid for it out of our Corona Relief Fund grant money. So we're already currently paying for it. So even though it looks like it's a new item in here, it just was funded out of a different source for the current year. Questions or comments? Okay. Um, is it communications that's next? Yep. Yep. Is this uh, chief? Is this you or deputy chief Hart? I don't believe either of us did it. Well, uh, I think it's me. <laughs> yeah, it, <laughs> kind of. Uh, it's a first selectman uh, budget that uh, the chief and I have been managing for years, uh, just portions of it. Like for example, we weren't on a, a, a maintenance agreement with any vendor. So we got uh, using the communication line, we got on, a, we went out to bid, we got on uh, 
a, uh, a vendor to uh, maintain our radio network. Um, we, we assist you and uh, the treasurer in maintaining this line. So if anybody has any questions, I can probably answer. Well, the, the one point that I would make about the, um, the budget pertinent to um, dispatch is that now that we're separating out the Broadbrook Fire Service from the town budget as well, that uh, budget line is, Amy, correct me if I'm wrong, but that's going down to 9,400, right? Yes, and that would be just the East Windsor Ambulance portion of the dispatching bill. So both fire departments are, are out. The police obviously use their own dispatching service. So that's, that's just reflective of the uh, ambulance. And that's a fee we pay Tallinn Network. Yeah. Okay. Any questions or comments on that? Uh, yeah, just a quick question. Uh, I, I, I notice in the detail that you have on that, uh, in this area, we're paying for um, annual maintenance for firehouse software. Um, is that a specific component of firehouse software that somehow gives us some sort of interface to dispatch or, you know, to, to data from there? Or, or are we paying for firehouse software here for both the fire departments? Well, it's coming out. That, that's current year. I'm not sure where anything talks about firehouse software at all. It's in the detail in the budget book, um, but Alan, that's the original or the existing budget. Um, it's not reflective of what is in the, the Munis run spreadsheet because that is showing uh, fire service expenses that is no longer going to be there. Okay. So just as a, a reminder to folks, and I should have done this at the outset, um, the, the documentation that's in the book represents either current year or initial department request you have to compare it to the Munis run with the revised budgets on it to show what the difference is between my budget recommendation and what was submitted by the departments. That's a departure from last year where Amy was able to show in the Excel spreadsheet um, the progression. So it's you have to turn a little bit more between pages now. Um, so Alan, that firehouse software notification is actually Talon Dispatch's expenses. So that detail tells us how much we're paying for each organization, what's Warehouse Point, what's Broadbrook, and what's East Windsor Ambulance. So it's their expenses that we pay to be part of their dispatching center. Okay, that's that was my confusion, because I know that the, the fire departments pay for their own firehouse software, and so this is actually a component from Tallinn. Yeah, it's it, the quote is from Tallinn, but even that expense won't be incurred by the town any longer going forward. Uh, understood. That, uh, if there are no other comments on communications, next up would be the police commission. I'd recognize Chairman Leach. Good evening, everybody. How are um, you? Good. No real changes. Uh, same as last year. Any questions or comments for Bob? Okay. Um, then, then I think we're done with the, the folks from the police department. And I, I would again, thank you all very much for, for your time and your preparation and putting this together. Great job tonight. Thank you very much, everybody. Thanks guys. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Um, next up is discussion of the board of education, unaffiliated pension amendments that don't think got circulated. Um, I actually want to postpone that and I want to postpone 9C as well. Um, there are some things I want to discuss with you guys, but it's a, a negotiation point. Um, so I don't want to do that in open session until we're, we're ready to take some action on that. So could I have a, a motion to uh, postpone those two items? Selectman Nordell will move to postpone 
Items 9B and C of the agenda, Board of Education Unaffiliated Pension Amendment and Board of Education Unaffiliated Pension Amendment Appendix H, clarification of Appendix I. Uh, is there a second? Read this as a second. Read and seconded, any discussion? Selectman Baker. Selectman Baker votes in the affirmative. He's muted though. Selectman Muska. Aye. Selectman Nordell? Aye. Selectman D'Souza? Aye. Okay. So we're going to pick up tax refund. Sarah Muska, Selectman, I'll move to approve the tax refunds totaling $4,379.37. Is there a second? Second. It's been made and seconded. Any discussion? Selectman Baker. Aye. Selectman Muska. Aye. Selectman Nordell. Aye. Selectman D'Souza. Aye. Now we'll take up uh, agenda item 9E, which is a discussion of the Steve Pace Municipal Agreement partial release. This was emailed to you folks uh, earlier today. I'm bringing it to you at the request of the tax collector who's bringing, who brought it to me at the request of uh, the Green Bank. Um, the, as I explained when we added this agenda item, uh, the arrangement has been that the town or towns in general provide a particular service for the Connecticut Green Bank and in exchange for that collection that's done at the local level, um, we're paid a nominal fee of $500. The Green Bank is interested in reclaiming that function from municipalities or, or at least partially refunding that function from municipalities and foregoing the $500 contribution that they uh, made to us uh, for that service. This is something that effectively means less work for our tax collector um, and basically no loss in revenue. It's a, a very, very small amount. Um, so Patty asked me to bring this to you uh, and to ask for your acquiescence in entering into the partial release. Uh, and so that's why this is in front of me. I would make a motion to authorize the first selectman to sign the partial release with the C Pace partial uh, to, to sign the C Pace partial release agreement. Is there a second? Read as soon as we'll second that. Motion has been made and seconded. Any discussion? Blackman Baker. Blackman Muska? Aye. Blackman Nordell? Aye. Blackman D'Souza? Aye. Okay. Um, I will execute that tomorrow. And actually, I'll do it before I go home tonight. Um, and Patty will be very pleased about that. Um, on to Selectman's reports. Um, we have some exciting things that are happening in town in the next couple of days um, or next week or so. Um, you may be aware of some of them, but I just, in the interest of sharing with the general community, um, I am very pleased to report that the town is hosting a COVID vaccine clinic in East Windsor tomorrow. Um, we have partnered with the North Central Health District, the town of Vernon and Priority Urgent Care, and we'll be administering about 100 doses of vaccine here in town. In order to get the vaccine, people must register for appointments ahead of time, no matter where they're trying to get it. Um, the town can help with that when people are trying to register um, and residents can call East Windsor Social Services for help with that. We'll be uh, going forward, we will be maintaining a waiting list um, and we will host these local clinics in town as often as possible, but that will really be dependent on the availability of the vaccine supply and how frequently we can get it. Um, in addition to the partners that I mentioned earlier, I want to sincerely thank and recognize our local fire departments, our police department, the East Windsor Ambulance Association, and our very dedicated town staff who have helped to set this up. Um, as of two days ago, we were operating under the assumption that we would be able to do a small clinic with 50 people. And uh, yesterday, we were told it would be 100 people, and we were able to get all of those spots plus a robust waiting list filled uh, to make sure that we can get as much vaccine into our own community as quickly as possible. 
Our partnership with Vernon will also allow for a very limited number of appointments at their uh, COVID vaccination clinic this Saturday. Um, only people who are eligible under the state's COVID vaccine distribution plan are eligible at either clinic. Um, and that includes so far medical first responders, healthcare personnel, long-term care facility residents, and anyone over the age of 65 years old. In order to maintain this, uh, this partnership with Vernon, which has allowed us to set this up and hopefully will allow us to prospectively uh, offer this as a service, um, we are seeking volunteers to help staff a regional call center. Um, the call center is located at the Rockville Public Library. Anyone who can make a regular commitment to help staff the call center uh, will help continue the Town of East Windsor's access to vaccine through the collaborative. If anyone is interested in volunteering at that call center, they're asking for half day shifts and they're asking for people to make uh, commitments more than one day um, so that when you go and, and you get trained, they can have some continuity and operations there. Anybody who's interested in volunteering at that can reach out to my office at 698-1334. I also want to share that the Town of East Windsor will be partnering with Southern Auto Auction, the Hunger Action Team, and USDA to offer a Farmers to Families food box pickup. We'll be distributing free boxes of perishable food items next Thursday, February 25th, and Friday, February 26th, from 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. while supplies last. The distribution point will be the Southern Auto parking lot located at 5 Phelps Road. Um, this is going to be done on a first-come, first-serve event. All households are eligible, but only one box per household. When they, um, uh, they'll be asked to stay in their car and make sure that they have room in their trunk. Um, we're looking for volunteers at this event too, and anyone interested can call 860-698-1450. We're also now offering assistance with tax preparation through AARP for returning senior center clients. This free service is offered to senior citizens in our community to help them complete their filings at no charge. Yesterday, I was very pleased to join UConn's T2 Center to talk about ways to stay connected with the community during the pandemic. Other, panel, uh, other panelists included transportation professionals, Council of Government representatives, uh, and private consultants. And we all agreed that the changing circumstances of the pandemic have led to uh, a new urgency in terms of finding ways of engaging constituents. Um, it was a, a really good conversation. I thank them for having me, and I thought the conversation was uh, beneficial. More than 50 people participated in that um, or, or listened to the panelists present at that, which was um, pretty impressive to see. Lastly, I want to point out um, that the town is in need of volunteers to serve on boards and commissions in the community. Uh, we currently have uh, vacancies or openings on many boards, and we need to um, ask folks to step up and, and serve where they're comfortable there. Anyone interested in serving on a board and commission can reach out to my office or uh, can fill out an application that can be found on the town website. That's all I have and I would call on the deputy for selecting. Thanks, Jay. Um, well, if you're tired of the cold and this cold and the snow, just hold on to the thought that spring is only 29 days away. Our budget workshops are in full force on February 8th. Um, we had our first set of budget workshops on February 9th. I attended the planning and zoning meeting via Zoom. On February 10th, I met with First Selectman Bowser on the budget reports. I needed clarification on the budget report issues. Um, February 11, 2021, I attended the police, commis police commission meeting via Zoom, which I was glad I did because I was able to see that presentation for the first time, I was able to absorb and double check things. Um, so I'm glad, glad they did that again tonight. February 16th, I attended a Zoom uh, meeting for the Economic Development Commission where the election of office were voted on. Gilbert Hayes, chairman, Bob Like is vice chair, and Jim Richards is the secretary. On February 16, 2021, um, our second set of budget workshops. February 17th, I attended the East Windsor Housing Authority meeting briefly as they had executive session that was lengthy. The residents of Park Hill were recipients of covert related necessities from the Rotary Club. Uh, they provided them with hand sanitizers, masks, and a few other things. Um, they also received a box of food from the Lions Club for each of the 84 households um, up at Park Hill. So thank you to both of those organizations. February 18, 2021, budget presentation and a board of selection meeting. Um, here in the course of the month, we see for the South Street
pandemic has been implemented. Complimentary face masks and brochures were issued to the board, and I placed them in the mail slots at the town hall. Um, but just to get the thing out, these are the face masks um, that actually say uh, changing the script. Um, and there's also a brochure that's been included that I'll make part of my report. Um, but it's for prevention, treatment, and recovery resources for people facing drug misuse and addiction. Um, so I think based upon what the police department is looking to do, um, as far as addiction and mental health, um, I just think this is just something else that would add to it. So that's all I got, Jay. Thank you very much. Charlie. Yeah. Oh, I have one more thing. I'm sorry. Uh, point of personal privilege. Um, I don't know if everybody's aware or not, but um, our Senator um, Anwell lost his brother this evening um, to COVID. Um, so if you get a chance, if you could extend um, the town's courtesy um, to him um, and our condolences for the loss on the brothers. I know some of us have done it individually, but I think it would be good coming from us as a, a collective um, town. Thank you. Thank you for that. Yeah. Okay, um, on February 10th, I attended the police commission meeting. Um, this meeting consisted of budget presentations, just like our meeting tonight. I believe the police department has a great concept in their presentation of incorporating a sworn officer as also a social worker to help address the mental health calls that the police deal with on a regular basis. Uh, this is unique and proactive concept that has a huge return in investment for a small increase to the police budget. Uh, during the budget workshop process and various boards and commissions, we have heard a lot of comments and support of funding transportation next year for the vocational agricultural programs um, that the town offers to um, other schools. I hope the Board of Finance and Board of Education are taking these requests seriously. I strongly believe these programs allowing students to attend schools like Suffield to get an enhanced education in these fields, not offered here in town are crucial. Programs like these have been offered for many years and I think the value and end result of the students who attend these programs are exceptional. And that's all I have. Thank you, Charlie. Sarah. Great, uh, the Warehouse Point Fire Commissioners met on February 8th, which was the same time as our first budget workshop. So I was unable to attend. However, I did follow up with Chief James Barton and there were 54 calls in the month of January. The addition to station one was approved by the Planning and Zoning Commission at their January 26th meeting. The fire district has since applied for a building permit and after approval from the building inspector can begin construction. The Board of Education met on February 10th. Broadbrook Elementary School Principal Laura Fox gave the board a literacy update and Daryl Rulliard gave a curriculum report about the iReady diagnostic. Participation rates have gone up significantly, but it is important to note that students at home are not participating at the same rate as students in school. The board should be ready to vote on their FY 2022 budget at their next meeting on February 24th. Three changes were made in their budgetary favor, reducing the increase in their insurance line from 8% to 5% and reducing lines, special education, transportation and private and state tuitions, bringing their overall increase down to 2.9%. Last night, I attended the Board of Finance meeting. Michael Van Deventer of Mahoney Sable gave a presentation on the town's 2020 audit. Some highlights include revenues were 6,073,185 dollars more than budgeted, primarily driven by favorable variances on property taxes and related interests. Expenditures were 1,016,183 less than budgeted. There was a surplus of 517,133 reported by the school district. No instances of budgetary non-compliance were identified. The auditor did discover three bank deposits not recorded as revenue in the cafeteria fund. Um, school superintendent, Dr. DeBarge and school district business manager, Andy Paquette were not at the meeting to offer an explanation. Finance director, Amy O'Toole reported that the town's tax collection is at 90% 
noting that those who don't escrow their taxes through their mortgage were extended until April 1st. Um, and I did also comment on the farmers to families food box pickup and uh, volunteering on boards and commissions, which the first selectman already indicated. So I won't repeat that. And that's all that I have. Thank you, Sarah. Alan. The only thing I of note that I would add to the conversation is the, um, the applications that were in front of the board, as uh, Clark had mentioned uh, earlier tonight uh, at the uh, Planning and Zoning Commission, were withdrawn by the applicant. So um, those zone changes won't be made. And I, I think a lot of uh, the people in, in the area are probably happy to hear that. And with that, I will yield the balance of my time back to the chair. <laughs> Your five minute allocation is so noted. Um, one one uh, point of clarification or, or um, addition to what Sarah said that I just wanna clarify is that there were no, in the audit, there were no uh, findings of fact or, or problems on the town side of the audit, but the, it is recommended that the Board of Education submit to a corrective action plan. Um, and that, that is, a, I think, an important distinction that um, that has been recommended by the auditors, but that um, there, there is no, no issue on the town side of the ledger. Is there any public participation? Yes, there is. Gil Hayes. Hey, Gil. How you doing? Congratulations. Meeting, you guys. Well, thank you very much. You guys have very long meetings. <laughs> I wanted to be in public participation uh, earlier, but uh, because I wanted to uh, hear the proclamation, but I'll get to that. Uh, in your meeting on the 4th, I did express interest in Black History Month uh, in relationship to East Windsor, and I applaud you for the creation of a proclamation. I did speak with uh, Dr. DeBarge about the, uh, the school celebration in Black History Month. And she was very forthcoming in answering the school, to my delight, not only celebrates Black History Month, but the curriculum throughout the year uh, does, uh, does go into diverse social awareness. And they have what they call circle of social awareness clubs or groups where they discuss things like uh, Oh, uh, discrimination in the uh, PowerPoints uh, that they do have. I had some written down here, but it's all a bunch of scrambles. Uh, one, one example is uh, diversity. And they, diversity, and the example they give was the art of thinking independently together. And that's a good, good uh, segue into discussing uh, different things like uh, Oh, they, they have a whole group here of, of things that, uh, hold on, I had it here. And I know it's late, you guys been here a long time, so I'll, I'll just cut it short, all right? Uh, the school does, does do it throughout the, the year, and Dr. DeBarge, uh, back and forth, uh, has sent me many examples. I do, uh, well, I would ask the question that the reading of the said document to the record, is that necessary? Shall we just go on the uh, website? What do you think? The, the, the uh, proclamation of Black History Month for East Windsor. Uh, it's gonna be included in the minutes. It'll be posted on the website. That's good enough. So I won't hold you up any longer. There's, there's several things that I, I found out about the school and uh, very enlightening, but I won't hold you up any longer. It's all on, the, on their website. And I'm satisfied to uh, me just, it's not just me satisfied. It's just, uh, just I, I brought, brought it up in your, your meeting on the fourth. So uh, I just stuck to it, not to, not to poke any problems about it, but it looks like we're going forward. A stick, uh, stick I think gathered together is unbreakable. So I read that somewhere. I'm not taking <laughs> credit for that. <laughs> But thank you very much, uh, Board of Selectmen, First Selectmen, uh, and good luck going forward. Thank you. Thank, thank you. I'm all done. Hey. Any other comments from members of the public? Seeing none, um, 
we will have an executive session and I'd ask that we have a motion to go into executive session to include. Hey, I think that guy might still be trying to get, oh, maybe he's just trying to get out. Perfect. Um, we will have an executive session to include uh, Amy O'Toole. Could I have a motion? Selectman Nordell will move to executive session, including Amy O'Toole. Is there a second? Second. Motion's been made and seconded. In discussion. Selectman Baker. Aye. Selectman Muska. Aye. Selectman Nordell. Aye. Selectman D'Souza. Aye. We are going into executive session at 9 p.m. Peg, I do expect action to follow. So I'll get the recording up as soon as I'm. Okay, thank you. Good evening. 928, we're coming out of executive session. Uh, if, is there any, any further business to come before the Board of Selectmen? Seeing none, a motion to adjourn would be in order. Selectman Nordell will move to adjourn at 928. That was a tie, but Charlie went uh, all the way through it, so I'm, I'm giving it to him. Is there a second? Second. Motion's been made and seconded. Any, uh, it's non-debatable. Selectman Baker. Aye. Selectman Muska. Aye. Selectman Nordell. Aye. Selectman D'Souza. Aye. We are adjourned at 9.28 p.m.